Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another evening where we where we are able to get together before you, Father God, electronically. Father, through our this this amazing technology, Father, we just thank you for the blessings on each and every one of our lives that we're able to access the internet, afford the internet, be able to leverage this technology and and do good works on behalf of your kingdom and our King Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the clear radio waves, the the clear sound quality that that we've been getting for the last couple of weeks now on Wednesday nights, Father. We just give you all the praise for that. So many of us have been praying about that, Lord God, and we just thank you for that. Father, we thank you for every night that we have, that we were able to sleep with a roof over our heads, that we're able to uh, sleep a whole night with, uh, without any pain, Father God. We thank you for the food that's on our table, the roofs that are over our heads, the jobs that, are, that we have. And for those of us who are seeking jobs, Father, I just ask for a supernatural blessing and an outpouring to come down upon every listener of this radio show. Father, you say, seek ye first the kingdom and your righteousness. And all these other things will be provided to us. And Father, we're going to hold you to that. Lord, for those people out there that are listening to this show, Father, we're just going to ask for a miracle to come up, that just a, a miracle to come down on their lives, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray that they will seek you with all their heart, that they will correct any sin or iniquity or, or bad thoughts that they have in their life and seek you with a fully repentant heart, Father God, so that you are able to reach out and bless them and touch them and make a corrected course in their life so that they can receive your blessings. In Jesus' name. Father God, we also lift up again, once again, Father, we're going to continue to keep praying for your people, Father. We lift up the state of Israel. We lift up your holy lands. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, that you will raise your right hand of righteousness over the country of Israel, Father. We ask for a supernatural blessing, a holy fire, a hedge of protection to surround round about that country and your people, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray that every weapon raised against your people, or every weapon raised against your holy land, Father God, whether earthly or spiritual, spiritual in the name of Jesus is absolutely thwarted it is taken out that you are should that you show yourself mighty before the entire world lord god so that people are drawn to you so that they know who you are so that they know who our king is jesus our advocate and our friend Father, we know now that you are going to wake up the church. Father, we thank you for that. We praise your holy name. We thank you. We praise you. Thank you. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Praise you, Lord God, for waking up the church. Praise you, Lord God, for bringing millions, maybe billions of people to repentance. We thank you for the scripture that says, All those who call out upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We lift up our family members before you, Father God. We lift up our husbands. We lift up our wives. We lift up our daughters. We lift up our cousins. We lift up our aunts and our uncles and our grandmothers and grandparents and the people that are dear in our lives. Our co-workers, Father God, every one of them that we reach out and pray for, Father, we pray with petitions before your throne room in the name of Jesus that you will touch them. When the, when the earth begins to shake and when the comets begin to fall, Father God, we pray. In Jesus' name, that you will lead them to salvation. Father, and last but not least, I ask, please, Father, for those who are regular listeners of this radio show, even the new listeners of this radio show, Father, that are struggling with sin, are struggling with sin issues in their lives, they know what those issues are. We know in our hearts, Father God, when we're not right. When there's something we're doing in our life that isn't quite right, it bothers us. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name that you, for anybody who's just not really sure, that you fully reveal it with great clarity, Father God, that you ready your bride in the name of Jesus. Father, that you ready her in righteousness and holiness, that they repent for their behaviors, that they change their mind for the behaviors that they have in their lives, Father God, and that you give them a supernatural, abundant grace in their lives, a supernatural touch to overcome the last issues that they may have standing between them and being found worthy to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present to you, present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. That's powerful. I love that. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling... You know, now I've I've added that's a that's a prayer that's added to the end of the book of Jude. What a blessing! That is so powerful. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, who is that? That's Jesus. That's Yeshua, our King, our friend, our advocate. Tonight we get to learn about some exciting possible mysteries. You know, um, Brother Zen Garcia. We brought him on the show many times. Um, Folks, I'm here to tell you, break out your Bibles, uh, uh, particularly Psalms 82. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and pull that up real quick. Uh, Psalms 82. Now, uh, you, if you were to approach um, you know, any 99 out of 100 uh, theologians, even the really smart ones like the Chuck Mislers and, and, and all those folks... They're they're not they're not gonna feel comfortable talking about Psalms 82, and I'm here to tell you that I've had periods of time when I believed with all my heart that Psalms 82 clearly was talking about us, talking about us, the the people that are living on this earth, the the at, at the Adamic bloodline, if you will, uh, those who were written in the Book of Life before the foundations of the earth. Amen. I've always believed that. I mean, uh, didn't always believe it, but but for many years I have. And but then there would be times when I wouldn't be sure. What, but then the Lord would cause some kind of supernatural thing to happen that would confirm it. An impossible phone call or or uh, email or whatever, and and I would be like, wow. But recently, it wasn't too long ago, a couple of months ago, we had this pastor of about you know thirty plus years, a you know kind of a Pentecostal non denominational super pastor, uh, and uh, and he he got in contact with uh, Kenneth and I, and he told us uh, you know in confidence because he really was still soul searching, <laughs> still soul searching on it, but he he came right out, and it wasn't solicited. That was the thing that was so absolutely supernaturally phenomenal about this occurring. I mean, I cried. I was in tears. I was so happy for this confirmation from the Lord to have this pastor who's well-known, worldwide, awesome, awesome guy come in confidence and tell us. Actually, he even sounded a little confused. He wasn't really sure how to handle it. He said the Lord told him on no uncertain terms that we are the people spoken of in Psalms 82, where it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges amongst the gods. Um, that would be minor gods with a little g. How long will you just unjustly and show partiality, partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, sons of God. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Wow. You gods, you minor gods, this is a judgment. This is a judgment. Our Heavenly Father judged these minor gods, sons of God, sons of God, and told them, you're going to have to die like men. You goofed up. You were very bad. This is a judgment. I am the great El Elyon, the Most High God. I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. And I am judging you minor gods. I am telling you that as part of your punishment, you shall die like men. Wow. That's powerful. And then, if you jump over to John 10.34, and it says, there's something very mysterious there. <laughs> and Jesus looks over at the Pharisees, and Jesus answers to them. He answered to them, Is it not written in your law that I said ye are gods? That's little g again. See, Jesus said, I said ye are gods. And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came... And Scripture cannot be broken. 
do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world? You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. See, Jesus came right out and said this mysterious thing that just anybody who reads it, it should be like, what? You said that I said that ye are gods? Well, there's only really two places that this phrase is used in the entire Bible and the other place is Psalms 82. And it's like, wow. So but then we get this pastor and he tells us this. He, the Lord told me that, 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 that Psalms 82 is about us, but I haven't really, un, I don't really understand that. And boy, I'll tell you what, Kenneth and I were reeling. We were so happy. It was like, praise Jesus, just one more of those powerful, mighty confirmations about uh, the information that we're going to bring forward tonight on the show. Now, this is very, very, very advanced information okay this isn't the, you know this is the kind of information that you need if you're going to try to help a new ager come back to jesus if they got lost in the galactic federation of lies um if you if, if somebody is sitting across the table from you and they say well i don't understand how a god can love somebody and still send them to hell that just doesn't make sense to me guess what you need to know the kind of information that we're going to bring forward to you tonight. Because when you realize that we are those whom are being spoken of in Psalms 82, you can give that person a coherent answer that blows their mind and helps them to completely understand why we're in this situation that we're in here on this earth. Praise Jesus. What an amazing revelation. It's very, very exciting. Kenneth? It is. It is really exciting, John. Now, the thing we have to stress is that this isn't essential for our salvation, but it is advanced, like you said. So this is if you're getting into, uh, hey, I want to be a disciple. I want to be more than just your bread and butter believer. I want to go out there and serve the kingdom on this side and the other side of eternity. You know, um, my my dear teacher, uh, and, and I, I learned a lot of what I know about the Bible from Pastor Rogers, he used to always say, before you can be given authority, you have to learn to become or come under authority. So the point here is, if you want to uh, get into the inheritance and rewards, if you want to really understand what it means to rule and reign with the king, then, then this is the type of thing that will help you have understanding. So this, like you said, is very advanced and very exciting. Oh, yeah, it's very, very advanced. And, you know, again, the, there's articles that you can read if you're not up to date on, you know, but I wrote some really, they're kind of elementary freshman-level articles that are, that are sort of introductions to the concepts of the hypothesis. I won't say that these are absolute facts because it's very difficult for any of us, including Brother Zen Garcia, who's the author of this book, Skyfall, um, Angels of Destiny. Um, he, he, you know, he's very humble. The, the guy's awesome. He's incredibly knowledgeable and very humble. And and you know we all have to be good Bereans, Acts seventeen eleven, and and study the Scripture daily to see if it were so. Amen. And 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 really, uh, basically, Zen is is a brilliant, full of the Holy Spirit, and he, uh, as so many uh, advanced theologians of today, um, Zen's not a you know a formal theologian. Most of us who 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 advance into the really uh, cool mysteries of the Bible uh, don't have that theological, you know, background holding us back, you know, because in theology and theological institutes, you're told, oh, you can't go there, you can't think like that, this is how you think, this is the way this is, because if you don't, we're going to flunk you out and you won't get your PhD after your name and all that kind of stuff. So, praise Jesus. So, be careful how uh, you you hear, because, you know, if you hear with, 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 with a predisposition to think that it's, you know, unusual, strange, or you can't accept it. If you have, you know, a, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Amen? Amen. Praise Jesus. So, anyway, uh, uh, very, very exciting information, and uh, and we're really, really, really excited to bring Brother Zen on to talk about his new book, Skyfall, uh, Angels of Destiny, because it uh, it's going to open up some really, really cool 
um, um, you know, uh, postulations that uh, he was able to assemble from his extremely advanced and thorough study of the text in the Nagamati Codices, uh, the text, you know, basically they make up the, apoc- the Apocrypha and the Pseudoepigrapha. Those are books like the 22 lost books of the Bible that are mentioned in the Bible, but we don't know where they are, or, you know, they are mentioned in the Bible and we do know where they are, that kind of stuff. Uh, again, there was 14 books of the Apocrypha that were included in the 1611 King James Bible that are no longer there. You'd be hard-pressed to get a hold of a Bible that had those books in it. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Praise Jesus. Um, so anyway, uh, really, really excited to cover some of this material this evening. Praise God. So um, I had something kind of supernatural happen, and I thought I'd share it with you. Um, it, it's it's really kind of cool. Um, the forces of darkness out there, uh, it's no secret to those of us who who have historically studied such things, uh, those of us who have probed around on YouTube and looked at all the uh, work, you know, from uh, uh, folks like Jonathan Kleck and so many other you know, really blessed people who have, you know, who rat out the devil, okay? They they basically have gifts, and they're able to see um, symbolism and connect dots, and, you know, it's that whole Tex-Mars paradigm where, you know, they can, they can see hidden, you know, because it's all about, uh, as Jonathan puts it, it's all about, uh, you know, the whole Isaiah 29 uh, paradigm, which is a prophecy that basically explains that the, that the devil and his dark minions turn everything upside down so that it can be esteemed as the potter's clay. Okay, and really that's just kind of a metaphor for explaining that they hide their their dark secret uh, symbolism and stuff and, and they kind of stamp it. It's a form of lesser magic and they do it all over the place. I mean the Toyota, Toyota logos, the different logos on a lot of the cars out there are alien heads. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And then if you listen to like for example the John Todd testimony, J-O-H-N-T-O-D-D testimony uh, on YouTube. You can type that in there and search on it. He'll tell you all about what he knew uh, back in the 70s about how they do this stuff, all the major corporations hide, you know, their Illuminati pyramids and all seeing eyes, the CBS logo, uh, you know, a prudential insurance, the list just goes on and on and on. It's very dark, very dark. Well, one of the things that's very, very dark is this whole ritual <clears throat> satanic sacrifice thing that they're constantly doing to us, okay, to, to God's potentially to God's sons of God, and also to, you know, people who, you know, are just ultimately unwitting victims and are are not yet, you know, entering into the the blessings of the kingdom. But either way, 9-11 was an inside job. I pray in the name of Jesus that you understand this. I pray in Jesus' name that if you don't know, that you will take the time to watch the movie Loose Change from beginning to end for free. Type it in YouTube and watch the whole thing. And if you come out, the same person, you know, then I don't, you must be in some kind of denial. That's all I can think of. But but the bottom line is 9-11 was controlled demolition, 10 tons of uh, Department of Defense grade super nano thermite. It can only be gotten through contracts and agreements with the Department of Defense of the United States military. Okay, it was it was it was lab tested by multiple parties. Um, they, they blew the thing up. I have photographs in my office of these 18 inch across solid steel beams used to support the structure sliced at a 45 degree angle from these wraparound wires of the super nano thermite and, and it just slice it like butter. It's impossible. There's no other way except thermite to bring down a building of that size, and that's exactly what they did. You can go to the 9-11 Architects and Engineers for Truth, 9-11 AE Truth. Look them up. They have a, a presentations. It should be no, and don't even get me going on, on World Trade Center number seven and who Marvin Bush is and that whole deal. 9-11 was a ritualistic, Luciferian sacrifice of human beings. It was the collapsing of two into one. It was it was symbolic, it was uh, demonically symbolic of the Romulus and Ramus twins, okay? They, the Romulus and Ramus, Ramus twins in, 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 in the Capitoline Wolf carving from ancient Rome shows two big Babies, those are human babies, by the way, um, um, suckling on the teats of a dog. Why? Because it's it's symbolic of the land of Canaan. Canine. Canine. 
land of Canaan. Get it? And two into one. It's two twins. Two twin towers collapse, go into one, which is world, uh, this new one world tr- center thing. This this uh, monstrosity that they placed in, 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 and it's a mosque. So they have erected, ultimately, a mosque, a Muslim mosque in the place of where the World Trade Center is, right in front of our eyes. And uh, Jonathan Kleck, God bless him, he'll be joining us on the radio show at eight, uh, at, uh, at about uh, roughly just before 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock p.m. this Sunday, the 26th, to talk all about that. Now, here is part of th- their, their labyrinthine, dark, twisted ways of doing these evil things. Includes, as uh, as uh, um, Bill Cooper put it on a CNN interview, and Bill Cooper is the author of Behold a Pale Horse, uh, he, they're using the Bible as a playbook, and in essence they are. It's it's a way of being flippant before our Heavenly Father. They're, 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 it's, it's, um, it's part of their way of desecrating the Scripture. And one of the things that they they did was uh, this whole 9/11. This is going to blow your mind, folks. And I'm sure Jonathan will reco- will cover this as well. But listen to this. Okay, so there's two key places that these forces of darkness in the Bible, 9/11. Think about it, 9/11. Well, you have in Genesis, you've got Genesis uh, chapter 11 and the first nine verses. All right, and in uh, Genesis chapter eleven, the first nine verses, uh, it talks about the Tower of Babel. All right, now why would that be interesting to these nine eleven Luciferian human sacrificing filthy demonic creatures? Well, because it says right here, but the Lord came down to see the city of the tower which the sons of men had built, and the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now listen, this is the, this is the most important part of this whole scriptural segment. Quote, Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Did you get that? Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. See, that's a huge statement. And there are many theologians who have done extreme studies of the Hebrew text and believe that this was, uh, Rob Skeeb is one of them, there's other ones, that there was, this was a type of a technology, that this wasn't just some kind of a, uh, you know, a tiered, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, pyramidic structure, that this was actually a, some type of esoteric, ancient fallen angel type of a technology. Okay, but nothing, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them? That's huge. And, of course, that would be Genesis 11, the first nine verses. 9-11, get it? 11-11. Nine, right? <clears throat> All right. Well, that's one little dark symbolism thing that they use to scoff at our Heavenly Father. But now let's take a look at Revelation 9, 11. Anybody out there read the book Apollyon Rising by Thomas Horn? Well, if you haven't, it's one of the best books, in my opinion, that's been written probably in the last, well, it's one of the best books I've ever written, frankly. It's really excellent work. Praise Jesus. Revelation 9, verse 11, quote, And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek has the name Apollyon. Wow! Are you kidding me? I just found that out. Jonathan was like, you gotta see. he called me up, he's like, yeah, hey, you gotta see this. So, they have literally... The whole 9-11 thing, it makes me wonder when, when they chose to make the choose what numbers to put on the cell, the phones. You know, hey, let's make the emergency you know hotline to the to, to EMS services. To Every home in the United States of America has to dial 911. Well, isn't it fascinating that symbolically refers to the rise of Apollyon, the rise of the Antichrist, their God, Lucifer. Wow. Well, this is unbelievable. You almost have to see it to believe it. But what I just mentioned to you, so write this down or make a note, 
It includes Genesis 11, the first nine verses. That would be 11, 9, right? Okay, and also Revelation 9, 11. Amen? 11, 9, 9, 11. Well, this morning, <laughs> while I was praying and talking to the Lord, I was sitting in my room in the dark quietly and looking over some Bible scriptures. And I have these little Bible apps that give me, you know, special verses and stuff for different occasions. And I hit the thing and I opened it up and it comes to the screen and the screen says, quote, I have hidden your word in my heart. Psalms 119 9-11. 119-911. That's impossible. Glory to Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are so awesome. Kenneth? John, you know that evil evil cabal, the Luciferians, the Sons of Belial, you know, the establishment, uh, the secret societies, whatever you want to call them, they go by so many names. They have been up to the same thing since Cain. Since the time of Cain and when the curse was put upon Cain, and you can follow it through all of history, and there's one quote that sums it up for the, the lost masses, and it was said by this man named Goethe. He said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. And that's what you see with millions and millions and hundreds of millions of Americans. They think they're free. You know, they, they go to their big box store on the weekend. They get stuff to work on their yard like little busy worker bees, and they, they pay for it with their plastic. And, and then they go to work, and they run on that treadmill week after week after week. And they don't realize that they're good little worker bees for this system that's being manipulated by these very evil and wicked men. I just pray that everybody's eyes are opened up to what this really is, what, how deep and pervasive this matrix is, so that they can see the light of the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, praise God. And, and it, it, it's hard to get your arms around. I mean, it's incredible. That's uh, We were so blessed to have uh, Ralph Epperson on the last show, you know, to talk about. And he's like the founding father of conspiratorialist history. As a matter of fact, I believe he coined the phrase of, uh, you know, that actual term, conspiratorialist history, where it's not implying that it's that it's a theory. It's, compl- it's implying the truth, which is it, it's a fact. It's Lucifer's manipulation of the world governments for hundreds of of years, thousands of years, ultimately, and millions. I mean, uh, you know, uh, boy, it's amazing. I mean, the whole thing goes back millions of years. The angel wars, the whole deal. It's very well. It's it's. I just want to get off this alien demon infested rock. Praise Jesus. Now, listen to this. This is powerful. I'm going to read to you Titus three verses one through eleven. <laughs> hey, hey, Kenneth, one eleven. I didn't plan that. Uh, that's another, I, John. I, I didn't plan that. I picked those verses out, and I'm like looking at it on the show notes, and it's one 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 eleven. There it is, and the three. Oh, I can't believe it. This is powerful. Praise Jesus. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, uh, anyway, the whole one eleven thing. That's a whole other story, and I'll, I'll get you know. It basically has to do with ascension. The New Agers take the word, the numbers one, and uh, mo- they put multiple ones together, eleven eleven, and they they tell everybody it has to do with ascension, and then they lie and say that oh, the Anunnaki who bred us and created us into humans uh, put some sort of trigger DNA gene into all the human race to see a one eleven eleven everywhere, and and I'm like, you know what? Lucifer does not have one single original idea. Everything is the father. And the and the born again born again saints that are out there seeing eleven eleven, I do believe that the that, that it is it has to do with ascension. I do believe that when people are seeing eleven eleven, I think it's coming from the throne room of God. I think it's the Lord telling his people it's time to leave. Praise Jesus. Take it back in Jesus' name. The devil has no original ideas. Praise God. Titus 3, 1 through 11. Listen to this. This is powerful. Remind them 
to be subject to rulers and authorities. To obey, to be ready for every good work. So now what this is talking about is this is guidance that's being given, commandments that are being given to the early church. All right? Remind them, the people of the early ecclesia, which is subject today, it's the same deal, to be subject to rulers and authorities and to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable and gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our, to our Savior toward man appeared, not by his works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God, should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And he's not talking about profitable on earth. He's talking about profitable in heaven, inheritance in heaven. Verse 9, 9-11. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Wow! Did you hear that? Avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, striving is about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless, and reject a divisive man, somebody who's just disagreeable, doesn't agree, and blah, 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 after the first and second admonition, well, brother, I don't know if you should, I don't know, you know, you know, you're very gently and humbly, I don't know, brother, and after that, you reject them, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning being self-condemned. Wow, that is powerful. Kenneth? That is powerful, John. You know, a lot of times we get so full of head knowledge that we want to go around and show everybody how much we know. I know that because I used to be guilty of that, and praise the Lord, he opened my eyes. But the point I want to make here is that when you go and do that, a lot of times you're divisive just by the fact that you're throwing knowledge around. And Paul warned us that knowledge puffs up. So what we have to do is is guard our tongue and, and just look at the circumstances. And if it's not going to edify, if it's not going to exhort somebody, if it's not going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's best to keep your mouth closed. Oh, yeah, amen. Praise Jesus. As a matter of fact, um, uh, probably the most wisest... I mean, you got to read Proverbs. I mean, the, the, all of it's in Proverbs. But, um, but if you look at Philippians 1, I think it's 22. Let me see here. Um... Uh, n nope, it's not. Uh, it may be 222. Uh, Kenneth, maybe you can help me find it. Where's Where's the uh, the the one that Dr. Jerry Lee likes to use all the time? Uh, let Let every man seek his own salvation with fear and trembling. It might be uh, Philippians 222 or something like that. But anyway, that that is the key. That that is wisdom beyond measure. Where where when somebody just wants to get in your face and well, this is what I think, and they want you to agree with them, and when you don't agree with them, they get mad at you and start calling you names and all that kind of stuff. Just back away. Just 
just quietly back away and and be you know god bless you you know philippians 2:12 okay praise jesus thank you kenneth um just back away from them and and if you've admonished them or said hey brother you know golly gee bro- brother you know you sh- you know maybe we shouldn't talk about this you know uh uh proverbs um uh, i believe it's uh, 6 16 says you know that uh creating division amongst the brethren is a is an abomination uh unto the lord so again you know it, it, you need to back away and you can just say to them you know just say god bless you brother you know let every man seek his own salvation with fear and trembling praise god that's very very good lesson to learn uh, to to step back sometimes and just avoid getting into those dissensions it's just not holy it's not righteous it's not going to do anything good for the kingdom praise jesus all right amen listen to this all right we all know that there was a bad tornado I mean, I think we do. So, it was bad, okay? And I'm not going to go into the the details of how bad it was. It was bad. And many of us were in tears. Many of us prayed a long time for a lot of people uh, who were victims of this situation. It was bad. Okay, now, but here's the thing. To those of us who recognize what time it is, and we understand the influences of Planet X slash Nibiru slash Nemesis slash the Destroyer slash the Horrible Star. Call it whatever you want to. And the coronal mass ejections and the disturbances of the sun and the signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars and the tectonic plate shifting and, this, and the earthquakes in diverse places and, this, and, this, and the stars falling from the highs like uh, from the sky like a fig tree shaken by a wind and that whole thing. For those of us who realize what time it is, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for knowing. Listen to what this man said at KFOR-TV in Oklahoma. You know for a fact that they weren't being sheltered in those schools. Please call our newsroom and let us know that so we can pass that information along. We've been unable to confirm whether the children were being sheltered in the schools or whether they had already been released. So help us to know that information. Mike? Linda, I think it's shockingly clear that that what we're looking at is, uh, tragically, the the biggest destructive tornado in the history of the world, because this destruction is dwarfing May 3rd, which was a $1.2 billion damage storm with 8,000 homes and 1,000-plus apartment complexes uh, damaged or destroyed. Uh, This one is, destruction-wise, is two to three times the magnitude of May 3rd, 1999. So this is the worst tornado damage-wise in the history of the world. In the history of the world. Kenneth? These are the things that Jesus said that we're supposed to be looking for, brother. Yo, it's They're impossible. And left and, where, <laughs> and where, left and right. Where? You know what? I'm not, I'm not saying this. I, I grieve for all the people that are suffering right now, but this is exciting because Jesus said these are the signs. They're all over, and these things are monumental, huge, huge, huge. So it's... It's a um, it's a grave time, John. Well, what's really amazing to me is that this guy, you know, I mean, the only, I mean, am I the only one who's perceiving this as the divine providence of the Lord? I mean, come on, think about it. This is a guy wearing a tight shirt, a, a white shirt, uh, standing on, you know, four W A R N severe weather, you know, uh, during a, uh, you know this crisis period, and he's saying the worst tornado in the history of the world. Now, for, let's analyze this, okay? How does he know? Okay, well, he's he's estimating based on the destructive force, the history of the world. Where in the world? No pun intended. Did this guy come up with that phrase? First off, there, to the best of my understanding, there aren't ancient texts. I don't think there's anything in the Bhagavad Gita. I don't think there's anything in the Mahabharata. I'm pretty sure there's nothing in the New Elish that talks about weather. I mean, you know, other than Planet X and that kind of stuff, but talk, you know, that does like weather reports and reports on tornadoes, right? So, how would anybody? Why would you choose that phrase? Don't you see? The only book that I'm aware of that uses the term history of the world, foundations of the world, those types of phrases is the Holy Bible. See, I don't see that man's choice of words coming from that man. I see them with the fingerprint of our Heavenly Father on them. 
Because that term, history of the world, that does not belong in the newsroom of KFOR TV. <laughs> Maybe on the Jack Van Impey show, but, but not on KFOR, KFOR TV. Right, Kenneth? Yeah, it was like watching a Jan Jack Van Impey clip or something, John, and this was just an, a, a local affiliate, a network affiliate describing an event. And, you know, we were talking offline, John. The weathermen, they talk about the strangest – well, they're talking about the most bizarre weather in the entire history of my life, which is five decades here, brother. And the thing that's so crazy about it is they're just talking about it like it's uh, nice picnic weather on Sunday. <laughs> Meanwhile, like we're having like scorchers, 90 degree weather here in in western Pennsylvania in May, and last week it was snowing. John, you figure that out. I can't. <laughs> Something biblical is going on. It's not normal. This is disturbing. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Bagley. <laughs> <laughs> and John, John, these guys, these these weathermen have to do it with a straight face. That's what I, I, I mean. They know things aren't normal, and they do it with a straight face. Yeah, amen. And you know what? What are the people that are waiting for Jesus to come and rescue him off this alien demon infested rock? Saying, Yeah, Hallelujah. That's what I'm saying. Praise God. All right, now here's a prophecy it just came out, I think, today, um, or very soon, recently, from Wings of Prophecy. This is Glinda Linkus, I guess is how you say her last name now, um, May 21st, and it's Many Lives Are Lost. Listen to this. My precious children, it is more important than ever now that you heed my words of warning to you. I will warn you of things to come, for I always tell my people what is coming, but you must listen and obey me. Many lives are lost in an instant in a tragedy. Many more in my judgments. But you, my precious children, shall be protected if you do not turn from my words to you. Time is growing shorter and many of my people do not believe the lateness of the hour. I am giving you signs now that this is so. Those who watch and pray will see the signs and know. They are those who shall be ready for my son's return. Oh, I love that. I love that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus, for that. The people who are watching are the ones who will be ready for the rapture. Hallelujah. They are those whose lamps will be full of oil. Oil. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That is awesome. Busy yourselves with my kingdom work, my children, for the time left to do my work is short now, and you lay up, lay up for yourselves treasures as you work to bring your brothers and sisters into the kingdom. Pray diligently and petition, that's the petition the throne room, through supplication, that's what that means in uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Read it, it's powerful. Pray diligently and petition constantly for the salvation of the lost and your loved ones. For I shall answer your prayers and save them. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for that word. There's so many people out there that are worried about their family. Thank you, Father. That is awesome. Great shall be your joy, and you shall enjoy the fruits of your labor. I hear your prayers, and I will answer. The times you don't hear my voice. I am still near you, watching you, working with you, and loving you. You are all precious in my sight, and I desire, and I desire, my, um, I desire you would take full advantage of all my son, of all my son died to give you in these last days. I desire none of his sacrifice would be in vain. Enjoy my blessings, children. Glorify me in all that you do. Lift high the name of my son Jesus, and walk in his ways that men may see, and know him. Praise Jesus. That is powerful. Kenneth? It is. It is really. John, you know, sometimes these scriptures don't mean much until you get into these circumstances, these phases in your life, and then all of a sudden they just, I always say it's like peeling back an onion. You know, every time you peel back another layer, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And then you start to cry because the reality sets in. And, John, these, these, uh, these revelations, these scriptures, these these awakening. I mean, I just 
I thought 20 years ago I thought I knew the Bible, brother. Ten years ago, three years ago, two years ago, and the Lord just keeps renewing through through the the, the mouths of prophets. Just just ram a revelation as the Holy Spirit ministers to you as you read the Word as we fellowship together. But brother, I'm blown away. I just I can't pick up a Bible or listen to a prophecy from somebody without just weeping anymore. I know. I'm a basket case. I mean, <laughs> it's like, oh, man. I, yeah, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Lord. All right, so check it out. So we talked about the, the comments. We talked about the prophetic information. We did the prophecy special um, on the 16th, the evening of the 16th, last Thursday. If you haven't listened to it, praise God, please take the time to listen to it. It's absolutely been confirmed by the Lord. It has been confirmed. That information is powerful. Uh, but listen to this. Uh, so, yes, we know that there's going to be calamities, that it's going to be a crescendo of events, uh, that we're heading into the uh, the revealing of the sixth seal, that all the seals are going to manifest in rapid-fire succession, just like we've been preaching through faith for the last two years. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the first verse in, in Revelation is, says that these things shall shortly come to pass. The Greek word is tachachii, which means rapid-fire succession. The seals, they, they don't have... They, yes, it's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth seal, that whole deal. It's in order, but here's what happens. All the seals, the seals on the scrolls get popped open, and then they all roll out at one time. Okay, so it's all going to be, it's going to be like civil unrest, calamities, um, uh, you know, the whole, uh, the third seal, the fourth seal, the fifth seal, the sixth seal, bam, 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 bam. It's going to happen real fast. That's what we have hypothesized and preached now for years. Praise God. What a wonderful thing to have that be a confirmation from the Lord. Now, now we know that's coming. Now, look, check it out. Listen to this. May 19th, four file, fireballs, comets, at four, that's four, in the last 24 hours. All right, and this is uh, Brother Mike Hankey, uh had, had, had sent, sent, sent this to me, I believe. But anyway, um, listen to this. In the last 24 hours, the AMS, that's the American Meteorological Society, has received confirmed reports about four unique fireball events, all occurring near 4 a.m. Uh, UTC time. The most recent event occurred over Arkansas, then Missouri, and then it goes on and mentions a couple other places, Arizona. Um, folks, four in a very short period of time. So, so it's increasing. Okay, the trending is going Going out of control. Praise Jesus. Then, just this evening, we got another uh, another prophecy um, from Sister uh, Sarah Fatu Treore. Praise Jesus. All right, and uh, her her prophecy she titled "The Closing of This Last Hour." Quote: Children of the Most High, my dearly beloveds, it is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It comes now. It is here. You are at the end of the age. My judgment unfolds before you. Man has come to the end of all things. Life upon the earth, as, as it has been known, is no more. Never have such times been lived before. Never has such darkness and evil ever been witnessed. Children, what has been unleashed is irreversible. What has already been unleashed is irreversible. That's what that's saying. There is no holding back. My plan to move forward is without delay, on time, across the entire earth. My fire fuels the wrath to come. My judgment that shall descend upon man shall be awesome, all-consuming, tragic for the lost who have not been found in me. It shall be swift and unrelenting. Catastrophic only slightly describes the ruin that shall amass upon man, complete and utter ruin and chaos. There shall be nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Escape shall be desired, yet there shall be none for those, except for those found in me. Remember Luke 21:36. Pray always to escape all these things that come upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. See, there is an escape. That's what it says in the Bible. Escape shall be desired, yet there shall be none for those except who are found in me, my faithful and true. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the doorway that leads to deliverance, safety, eternal peace, and bliss. Children, now comes the judgment unseen like ever before. Now comes the manifesting of even greater travail. The birth pains quicken. They shorten with much force to come. Much damage, they are released. This shall be... This shall be no easy delivery, delivery, excruciating it shall be. The earth shall be in agony, man in unbearable distress. I have warned, for it is written, still man continues to walk blindly and refuse to accept the condition of their existence. They look another war. They look, they, they look another way. Forsake my calls. They heed 
not to the signs of the times. This is the end, the very end of the age of man. There is no future for humanity, but that but what is in me and my heavenly rest. Children, the time has come for the closing of this last hour. Surely it is late. Much overdue. I cannot stand to have this earth proceed any, any longer. It shall not continue further. Prepare yourselves. I come to fetch my bride. Lord Yeshua. <laughs> That's powerful. Praise God. I'm I'm wondering if I should even have the contractor finish uh finish rebuilding my bathtub, Kenneth. They tore my bathtub out. Do you think I should even bother putting in a new bathtub or what? Uh, yeah, John, you you want to be scrubbed and you want to be clean I have before you shower. put your rapture jammies on, brother. I have another shower. I'm not suggesting I, you know, stink my way into the, you know, a, a rescue mission. <laughs> and besides, what about the peacekeepers? Go- what about the UN peacekeepers that are going to be using your house as some kind of staging ground? They're going to want to have a bathtub. Maybe just have a put in for them, brother. <laughs> yeah, praise God, praise God. Yeah, well, you know, got to finish what I started. It looks like anyway. Um, uh, oh. And there's a disinformation campaign, folks. This 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 information campaign, and and any of us who've been around the block a little bit and know about how the forces of darkness and you know the counterintelligence professionals that are hired, the COINTEL Pro, the agencies that are hired by the black ops government, the CIA, the NSA, these agencies, multi-million dollar agencies of young hackers who are who are commissioned to attack Christian websites, take down YouTube channels, and and all this dark stuff. Well, they're always doing these disinformation campaigns. Um, some people refer to them on the internet as trolls. They call them trolls. But you know, and they go on, and you know, if somebody says, "Hey, you know, this and that, this and this, and this and that happened," then they go in and they debunk it. You know, they hang out on places like Above Top Secret, Godlike Productions, on YouTube. You know, they're 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 professionally paid debunkers disinformation agents. They make money. They make good money doing this stuff. And they attack and hack websites and Christian take down Christian sites and stuff. Well, get this. And we're about to bring Zen, Brother Zen on, and that's why this is such an interesting introduction. Evidently, <clears throat> there is a promotion, and I'm not exactly sure. You'd probably have to look this up. But, it's, but it has a picture of a young, blonde girl. <laughs> and I... I laugh because, you know, the picture that's been painted of angels for most human beings, particularly anyone who's, you know, following the Roman Catholic persuasion over hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, believe that, you know, typically an angel is a blonde woman with white wings who plays a harp on a cloud somewhere, which is absolutely false. Angel simply means messenger. It's a messenger being. It's 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 a role. It's a it's a duty. Okay, and God has cherubim, seraphim, teraphim, ophanim. There, you know, the the list of uh, different types of sons of God, and they're all sons of God, folks. Okay, a son of God is any being. They're not all human. Any being that is created by the heavenly office of God, by God himself, to work on behalf of God. Huh? You, you, okay. That includes Lucifer. Lucifer is a son of God. It's a classification of beings, sons of God. We're sons of God. But so were the angels that came down in Genesis 6, 4, that came down on into the daughters of men. Some would call them holy watchers before they left their first estate and, you know, created Nephilim by, you know, defiling themselves and doing bad things with the daughters of men. Well, here is a advertisement looking like some kind of a disinformation campaign that has a, 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 a young blonde woman with white wings on it, and it says in big red letters, Alien Interview. Listen to this. The plant, planet Earth is not our home. It is our prison. Folks, 
This is so unbelievably true and material to the things that we're going to be discussing tonight. It is unbelievable. It's almost as if this was an intentional information campaign by the twisted New Age dark side of Lucifer's Galactic Federation of Lies that, 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 that they're out there already trying to – twist the truth with their leaven so that the people who are left behind after the rapture, arguably, well, without a doubt, the tribulation saints, which Revelation 12 refers to as the offspring of the woman at the very end, okay, they are. They're metaphorically the offspring, the people who are left behind that don't take the mark, that ultimately proclaim Jesus throughout the great tribulation, become the tribulation saints, but this, this information campaign, it's unbelievable that they would put this here because, in fact, planet Earth is a type of prison. As a matter of fact, Sarah Fatu Treore, in one of her prophecies, the Lord God, our Father, and G Jesus, I believe it was, speaking through her, actually used the word prison. This is an alien, demon, fallen angel, infested rock. Amen. Praise Jesus. And we want to get rescued off of here and go back to our first estate. We want to go back to the condition that we were in prior to the judgment that was levied upon us in Psalms 82. Praise God. Kenneth, I'm going to bring on Zen here in a second. Kenneth? Hey, hey John, while you, were, while you were talking about that, that advertisement, that disinformation campaign, Job chapter 1, verse 6 came to mind. And now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So amen to everything you said, brother. There are so many different classes and types of created beings that are all referred to as the sons of God. And Satan was among them, brother. Oh, yeah, praise Jesus. I have a book right here. I think it's right here. Yeah, here it is. Here's a book if you want to check up on me. This is by a guy named C. Fred Dickinson. Okay, he's he's a theologian. He's formally trained. He's a Christian author, and he wrote a book, Angels, Elect, and Evil. C. Fred Dickson. That's D I C K A S O N. All right, look it up. He explains all this to you in this book. If you look this kind of stuff up and you read about it, okay. So anyway, it's really cool. Praise Jesus. And now we're going to go ahead and bring on Brother Zen Garcia, and he's going to talk to us about his new book, Skyfall: Angels of Destiny. Hey, that, that fanfare was for you, Brother Zen. Are you there? I am, Brother. How are you doing this evening? Doing good. You know why you got that fanfare? Because it says in Proverbs 25, verse 2, it says, It is the glory of God to conceal it the matter, and the glory of kings to search it out. God bless you, Brother. We're so happy to have you here. Well, I'm honored to be here. It's always a pleasure to... To join in with a group of like-minded individuals, true true seekers that uh, go against the grain and fight against all odds, and you know we've had to unlearn so much of what we've been taught and have accepted as reality to come to the real truth. And so I you know, I honor each one of the your listening audience, and as, as I honor you and Kenneth and Kathy for all the work that y'all have done. Yeah, praise Jesus. Yeah, and thank, thanks, thanks to everybody, every, every one of you, Kathy, um, Rebecca, uh, B, Lee, uh, Kathy O'Connor, all of you. God bless you, every one of you, for all the help that you've given this this ministry and reaching out to people through the Facebook page. Praise God, it's just a it's a tremendous blessing. Um, hey, so uh, so oh, and one more thing before we break into the details of of this new and very exciting book, which I absolutely cannot wait to read, because um, folks, if you have haven't read Sons of God, Who Are We and Why Are We Here? That is a monumental work. Um, now, basically, what Brother Zen Garcia does with much prayer, much seeking of the Lord, uh, much praise, much much uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit, what he does is he uh, studies the extra uh, canonical books, the, the uh, many of them which were in the 1611 King James, many of them which weren't, uh, but but probably should have been. Uh, it, many of these extra writings, and he takes that information, he measures it for its veracity as best as possible after praying about it, and he looks and sees how it can be verified 
against the existing 66 book canon and providing that it doesn't, you know, completely, you know, uh, become invalidated by the existing 66 book canon, then he, he investigates it, maps it back, and puts it together in the form of a story to try to reconstruct the history of our existence back as far and even prior to Psalms 82, which is when um, arguably we were uh, the part of the um, divine council of gods that had to come to earth and die like men. So if you want to read pr a primer on this, go to tribulation-now.org, and in the black banner section there, click on the link to the article entitled Angel Wars and the Original Sin, Part 2. And in that article, it's got... It's all... That's like freshman level introductory stuff to kind of wet your whistle to these concepts because it's really, really exciting. So, and would you give everyone kind of a brief, just a brief high level synopsis of Sons of God? Who are we and why are we here? And just kind of, you know, wet their whistle as to what we're going into with the Angels of Destiny book. Sure. Um, well, basically, the Sons of God. I split it off from the book that I had published in 2010, The Lucifer, Father of Cain, um, because it, it had a whole different premise that I didn't want it to be judged with the, the title and with the animosity and the harassment and the ostracization that I've received from the publication of that book. And so... Um, I, and plus, it, it would have been like a 600-page book if I would have kept it all together. So I basically split that off. And really, The Sons of God, Who We Are, Why We Are Here, that book uh, explains everything leading up to the focus of my fourth book, which is uh, predominantly based on the origin of evil and explains the story of Adam and Eve's fall from paradise and having lost their bright nature and what the beguilement was. And I explained what the <clears throat> whole parable of, um, you know, what had happened in paradise and how Cain was a result of that fornication and, um, and, and then explaining how it was that having lost our first estate, we ended up being here on this prison planet in a fallen state of being. Uh, the Sons of God book goes, takes it from paradise and goes back all the way to the beginning of time, if you can call it a beginning, but basically explains the pre-existence of Christ and the, and the Father. I expound upon John chapter 1, um, which you know talks about Christ as, as being the Word, uh, as being the visible embodiment of the Father and how he and the Father are responsible for uh, the manifestation of everything within creation, even the um, the creation of the archangels, the minor angels. I explain, um, you know, the war in heaven, what occurred, how we were also pre-existent beings and that we were part of the sons of God, part of the morning star administration and that some of us that are in flesh embodiment now um some were part of the rebellion some fought for and worked for the elect and were part of those that uh against the insurrection and the rebellion and there were many that are in the flesh now that uh were basically the fence sitters the laodicean church of that day and age and uh, that's why a lot of us are in the flesh now uh, but that we are a reflection of all three classes. And and it, the war in heaven is basically an extension, um, a continuation, the enmity uh, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Uh, it ties and goes back to the war in heaven and that first estate. And basically that book um, explains, you know, how we were part of the divine council. It explains Psalms 82. Uh, it explains Jeremiah 1, chapter uh, verse 5, where uh, Christ, as the Word says to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were ever in, ever entered into the womb of your mother, and that I had ordained you to be a prophet among unto the nations. 
all these seemingly esoteric uh, subjects and passages that many did not understand why uh, the father hated Esau and loved Jacob, how he could, you know, hate a child that had not even yet been born. All these things are um, even further expounded upon in this book, Skyfall, Angels of Destiny. The things that I explain in the Sons of God book, but not in complete detail, because I do cover so much in that particular book. Right. Um, you know, basically trying to uh, reiterate the whole beginning of time all the way to where we are now, and, you know, tying in the whole war in heaven, the uh, the destruction of Tiamat, the war against the fallen angels, including the destruction of Atlantis, uh, the flood of Noah's day, Joshua's entrance into Canaan, uh, his order to wipe out every man, woman, and child, all these things, you know, even David and Goliath, the uh, explaining who the giants are, the sons of Anak, the fallen angels, the archons, and basically backing up all of this information with the full summation of what are the Old and New Testament, the extra-biblical, pseudepigraphal, uh, the Nag Hammadi codices, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Apocrypha, the Colburn Bible, uh, basically everything you can find out there as far as wisdom texts. Um, I, you know, uh, I explain all of them in conjunction, um, in alignment with what is revealed in the 66 book canon, and um, kind of put the pieces together to fill in what are the the deeper secrets and to help people to understand what Christ was speaking about in Matthew chapter 13, uh, talking about you know an enemy is having snuck into the garden and seeding the tares, uh, why it is that he references the tares as being the children of the wicked one. All these things, unless you have discernment on all of these aspects of what is esoteria, um, it's hard to understand what the gospel is explaining. And so all of my books help people to understand better what is written within the canon of the word. Right, amen, and it's so true. Um, uh, so, for for those of you out there who um, have recently become, you know, regular listeners of the show, God bless every one of you. Uh, this is extremely advanced stuff. Okay, so we're not talking. We're not talking, you know, Paul used to refer to as, you know, hey, you Corinthian, you church of Corinth, you guys are just drinking milk. You need to step up and drink, eat meat. We're, we're talking about, this isn't just meat. We're talking, this is like filet mignon with lobster tail. It's all a whole nother level of, of <laughs> understanding. Amen. And, um, and, and so let me just go ahead and, and explain the value proposition to this understanding. So is is the is just the is the is the random desire to become knowledgeable about all things mysterious or whatnot, you know, it that you could argue that that just leads to the Solomon problem. Okay, and, and what I call the what I I wrote an article about the Solomon problem. The Solomon problem is when you go out and you become really, really smart about something but you're not doing what Jesus told you to do, which is to get out there, preach the gospel, lay hands on the sick, heal the sick. You know, um, you know, we were told to disciple um, and 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 follow Jesus and ultimately lead our fellow brothers and sisters through our works and our behavior uh, to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That is our commission. Okay, it's not optional. It's part of what we're expected to do. Now. So when you when you look at this as just kind of like, oh, this is really neat head knowledge and stuff, well, it's much more than that. So as Kenneth correctly mentioned earlier, this, has, this, this isn't about salvation for people who already know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Where this information is absolutely monumental in helping somebody, bring somebody to the kingdom, is... Helping is answering the impossible to answer question. Okay, let me give you an example. You're sitting across the table from somebody, all right, and they say to you, and and that person says to you, how can God allow those people to die? How can someone who loves us allow um, those those people to be born in Uganda and starve. 
how can he allow he how can God send people to hell if he loves us all right these the 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 the, the answer to that question is to understand our origins in the universe it's to understand when God is holy, 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 those three holies hold a, an, an un, unbelievable amount of significance. There was a judgment, Psalms 82, that occurred millions of years ago, and that judgment included a lot of things that had to be accomplished. It's the reason why Lucifer is allowed to be alive and exists today. It's the reason why there will be a, a, a millennium kingdom. And it's the reason why Lucifer will be let out a second time after the millennial kingdom. It's the reason why there will be a second gog make gog invasion after millennium. All this stuff has been determined as part of this judgment millions of years ago. And, and when God is holy, 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 it means that he follows his own rules. See, this is a very important thing. If we don't understand these concepts prior to the foundations of the world and understand that we are living out a judgment that not only affects us, but affects the fallen angels, we are the judge and jury that is going to convict Lucifer and the fallen angels later. That's why it says in the scripture that we will judge the angels. It's not talking about the good angels. It's talking about the fallen angels, right? Amen? So right now, Lucifer is on a, uh, uh, in a, in a, court, a court appeal, and, and, and that appeals process will last until the final judgment when we, the saints, judge the angels. This is going to enable you, understanding these concepts will enable you to sit in front of a person that doesn't believe in God, doesn't understand the mystery, and just looks at it at face value and says, well, God can't love us, because if he really loved us, he wouldn't make us go through this. He wouldn't send people to hell. And that is not true. And if you understand these concepts, it allows you to speak to them, and you can choose your words wisely. You can say, well... Here's some information that might be helpful. And then point them to Psalms 82. Point them to Brother Zen's books and help them understand that our existence here on this earth is way, way, way bigger than any of the churches in the world are able to articulate. Zen? I agree, Brother. And I'm not trying to boast in any way on the discernment that the Father has blessed me to have. And you know, all glory, all honor, all praise, all worship goes to uh, the Father and the Son for the things that they have led me to. I'm basically just a servant that has been blessed to learn these things, and it's not anything that I'm special or privileged upon. Any one of you out there that gives yourself to study and in, in seeking the kingdom first in your life and placing the Father and the Son as the highest priority for your life and being will also find revelation similar to the things that I've been shown and the similar to the things that I've been taught. And so uh, anybody out there can commit themselves in a certain way to where you, the things kind of things, the, these kind of esoteric um, uh, secrets, because that's what they are. They are secrets. In Matthew chapter 13, Christ said that, uh, when he was speaking about the the garden parable, the separation of the wheat and the tares, and explaining how there's two different bloodlines and lineages, he, he said that I will tell you secrets that have been kept uh, hidden since the foundation of the world. And it's this generation, us as being the fig tree generation, we are the ones that are being the recipients of the outpouring of the spirit on all flesh all the things that have been kept secret even with the uh with the access to the internet and the fact that we can just keyword search in a search bar and get millions of documents all connected to that particular topic and and research it in such a way where we can 
absolutely know uh, for certainty all things about that particular keyword is just it's an amazing tool and so for this generation gaining access to knowledge and wisdom and secrets that have been hidden for so long is easier than it's ever been at any time prior and so we really have to uh, honor having that access and give thanks uh, for that kind of a blessing and we should absolutely utilize it to the best that we can to further our relationship with the Father and the Son in coming to know all of these things. Because uh, it is my opinion that for many of us, uh, those that are you know, truthfully advanced seekers that want to know uh, the secrets that have been withheld and that have been stripped away and the things that have been hidden from us, and I'm not saying that that is a necessity for everybody, because uh, it certainly wasn't for my parents, but I know for myself and for others that are like me, I want to know everything. Uh, you know, even with what had happened during the the infancy, the the youth of Christ, and, and you know, those kind of books and those kind of teachings are included in like the Proto Evangelion of James that covers the story of uh, the child Christ and uh, even speaks about Mary uh, utilizing the the bath water that Christ had uh, bathed in to heal other children. And so all of wow. these... Wow. Yeah, all of these things. I mean, you know, in the original canon, we have just one story of Mary and Joseph losing uh, Christ uh, when he was 12 years old and and having they found him again in the temple, but then we go directly to um, the story of his ministry, and then there's no fill in the blanks on the details of what had occurred the rest of his life, and he being God incarnate, the our Lord and our King, you would think that we as disciples would want to know everything that we can uh, about him, and that's just one part of what are the extra biblical texts that you know a lot of people are are afraid or you know because a lot of people say king you know the king james version only but that's just one instance you know where um these extra biblical books fill in the details on things that have been left out of the canon and they absolutely uh verify that he was God incarnate and that he and the Father are, were one. And so, you know, study of these other pieces of the puzzle um, help, in my mind and in my opinion, to to elaborate upon the things that are built up as a premise and as a foundation in the original canon. Oh yeah, amen. And 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 one of the things that was an incredible and supernatural confirmation for me <clears throat> was um when I was uh, when the Lord basically instructed me. I, I don't, you know, it's not like I have these like back and forth conversations with the Lord all the time, but I I can very clearly remember specific times when, you know, I heard that still small voice and and then m when I responded to it appropriately, uh the the net result was something supernatural occurred and and at one point I was told um to uh to read this book by Bruce Allen uh, Pastor Bruce Allen entitled "Gazing into Glory," and I couldn't believe it. There was this. There was part of his testimony. He was taken up uh, by the Father into outer, you know, outer space. Uh, and and the, and the Lord was showing him, teaching him things, you know, about he put a door there in in outer space, and he was standing in front of the door, and he was told to go through the door, and he said, I don't know how to go through the door, and and the Lord, the our God, told him uh, that in order to understand how to go through that door, you need to read the Apocrypha. So the Father actually told this guy, Pastor Bruce Allen that he needed to, to read like the Book of Enoch and some of these other extra-biblical books in order to understand, because evidently they're inspired text, 
even though the the canon committees don't think they are. And that's um that's actually kind of a travesty. But when I read that, I was like, wow. So here's here's a question. So so to to stay on track, you know, with with the uh, Skyfall book, Angels of Destiny, and 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 try to keep it at a level where people don't get too lost in the what I consider to be some of the exciting details. Um, there is this concept, keep it at a high level, There was, a, and I know I'm leaving a lot out, I realize that, but just to keep it flowing, there was an angel war that occurred millions of years ago, and I know I'm oversimplifying, but okay, an angel war that occurred millions of years ago, uh, arguably we were involved in it, uh, it the, the, we were referred to in the current Bible, in Psalms 82 is part of the divine council of gods, you know, uh, and um, and uh, uh, we we fell, we goofed, we goofed up, and um, and our, and some would argue. I think Kent, I think I think Yuzen had agreed that potentially uh, how significantly we goofed up during that war potentially leads to our personal place on the earth. So some would say, well, why is it un it seems unfair to me that some people are born in this country and some people are born into poverty and well, we all have a hard time finding our way to the narrow gate of the kingdom, no matter regardless of where we end up in life. But it seems that some would have it worse than others. And so that tracks back to this idea of a judgment that occurred. So we've gone through the judgment the angel wars have happened. We goofed up. We have to die like men. And can you tell us? I mean, looking at like the the titles of these chapters in the book, and all I have is a table of contents here, folks. Um, you know, what is the whole deal with the cup of forgetfulness? How did that whole thing bring us to where we are today? Okay. Um, well, basically, before we incarnate into flesh. We And we are given the exact circumstances and situation necessary to to bring us back to remembrance um and for a lot a lot of those that were you know like the usurpers and the rebellers, they are born of the Cain line, but that does not mean that they are excluded from salvation because Christ died on the cross to give a salvation and chance for a return to the first estate to all of the people, the pagan nations, the Gentiles, uh, even the elect. And so everybody still has chance while we are in flesh embodiment to to embrace Christ and to know him and to follow the commandments and the law and the law and to do the works uh necessary of remembrance to bring ourselves and others to knowledge of all of these different things. But basically it has to do with election, and that is a concept which is not expounded upon, um, but just in a very few chapters, but it is covered in such a way within the Old and the New Testament that it helps to explain for those that have discernment the whole premise behind the, uh, you know, why Jacob was favored and why Esau was hated even before they had ever been born into the flesh. Because these things tie back to the situation of our first state. And in in the contract of coming into the flesh, basically we are uh, asked to drink of the cup of forgetfulness so that we have to struggle to gain remembrance and to gain knowledge and to gain insight into what was in order for us to come to understanding on our higher purposes for being here in the flesh now and for us to be able to embrace our what is our destiny and what is the higher purpose that the Father and the Son have foreordained for us before coming into the flesh, just like with uh, Jeremiah and Moses. And in this, and I did send you the book, John, so I sent it to both you and Kenneth and, and Kathy, so it's in your, um, it's in your email. Uh, but anyways, um, basically, it's, 
I show through the very many different scriptures that are available that are connected to all of these ideas, uh, and I expound upon pre-existence, predestination, and pre-election. And in in and I break it up kind of into three uh, areas uh, of interest that I explain um, with great detail. One is the pre-existence of Christ. Uh, the other, the pre-existence of the saints, and then the pre-existence, our pre-existence, the pre-existence of humanity. And I utilize all the different scriptures that are connected to these uh, principles to explain all of this in great detail. And I touched upon, for those that are familiar with my book, Sons of God, Who We Are and Why We're Here, I touch upon a lot of this information within that book, but I in no way elaborated in detail the way that I have within this particular book. Uh, this book is basically 300 pages of explanation on all of those esoteric topics and those hidden secrets that are, are contained in not only the Sons of God book, but uh, my book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. And this ties all of that information into detail with the explanations of because um, I, I, I've had a lot of people ask me about remembrance and about the first estate and about the war in heaven, uh, what led to our fall, how we find ourselves in flesh form now and so all of these things are com uh, contained in great detail within the context and the scope of this book and so I try to, and I also include at the very end of the book my own personal story of how it was that I came to this knowledge and and to this remembrance. Amen. So, so then, it, and and uh, Kenneth, I want to hand the microphone over to you real quick. But um, so, like, I mean, there are references if you have an electronic Bible, folks. I mean, and, and that's the only way to go. I mean, it, I, I'm I'm sorry, but if you're flipping pages in a piece, of, you know, in a paper Bible right now, and it's 2013, and it's almost the end of the age or whatever, um, you know, you really, if you're going to study this kind of stuff, you need a powerful computerized Bible. Now, I I personally have been very blessed by having um, uh, the PC Study Bible Professional Edition, and it's it's a very powerful tool. And I'm telling you, like I, for example, I searched on the word elect, but I I searched E L E C T star okay for the new testament you would not believe how much mystery scripture is uncovered by just that one search for example listen to this folks try to get your your typical church pastor to explain this one to you okay this is in uh timothy first timothy chapter 5 verse 21 i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Wow. What's up with that? What is your hypothesis on that one, Zen? Well, the elect angels were part of those that, you know, fought for uh, and with the cherubim angels and with Michael and with Christ in fighting against the insurrection and the rebellion, uh, the rebellious angels who... You know, we get a great deal of information on the Watchers and the 200 Watchers that came to the planet uh, during the time of Yared. But in the second book of Enoch, it, it also speaks about the rebel angels that were kicked out of the heavens uh, after the separation of light and darkness with Lucifer, who became Satan the adversary. Uh, and this information, you know, that this again is part of the uh, the apocryphal, the pseudepigraphal text, the two books of Enoch, uh, which we have three of them, but the two, the first and the second one, give great detail uh, as to why the fallen angels and why the fallen watchers were banished from the heavens and explains the two b rebellions in great detail and connects uh, connects the evil that we see prevalent in the world today to their um, you know, their introduction of all the different secrets of the heavens to humanity and their interdiction and their marrying into the the 
you know, with the daughters of Cain and uh, creating the race of giants that later became cannibals and began to drink blood and war against humanity. Uh, all these different things, unless you have uh, the insight of Enoch in the extra biblical books, you you might blame God for the evil that you see in the world today. But evil was the manifestation of the free will of not only the fallen angels, but that of humanity. Um, because we have been wrong, uh, responsible, we've been led astray into uh, following idolatry and to, um, you know, it, taking part in what is considered abomination. And that's why it is that the, the Father laid out in the Ten Commandments, the first two having to do with idolatry and the worship of other gods, to take no other gods before him. And then the others are to basically teach us to love one another and to treat each other as we would want ourselves to be treated and as we love our Father and our King. And, uh, you know, love is the whole of the law. But unless you understand that there are powers, principalities, rulers of darkness, uh, not of this world, the archons, the fallen angels, uh, you know, the, the Anunnaki, the ancient aliens, whatever you want to call them, unless you understand their presence upon this plane of existence, you, you won't even understand what we've been teaching about as far as the strong delusion because all that is being established and set up too. And it says that even the most elect would be deceived if it were possible. And so that's a whole other area uh, that you and I and, you know, Jonathan and a lot of our friends have been covering for many years. And and that people, most of the, you know, the New Agers and those that are uh, following the Vatican and the, you know, the how the Vatican has come out that the Space Brothers are a little bit closer to God than us and, you know, that we need to listen to them. All that is part of the deception that is being established for the introduction of the Antichrist. And so uh, unless you have discernment on what seems like just mind-blowing, fantastical, you know, fairy tale mythology, things that shouldn't be, uh, spoken about because how could they be contained within the Bible, within the Word, but they absolutely most certainly are. If you do not have this discernment, you could easily be led astray because that premise is being established and it's going to lead a lot of people um, back into idolatry without ever realizing it. And so that's why it is that you know we do the work that we do. And especially myself in trying to bring out all of this information uh, in the series of books that I've written about all these topics. Can hey, Zen, this I'm, I've been scrolling through the uh, draft you sent, and I'm blown away. You know, it just picks up, like you said, where the sons of God left off. And by the way, that book has just been, it been an incredible blessing to me. I have to tell you this. I was born and raised in the Roman Catholic Church. I went to the Catholic school with the nuns in the long habits and the white things around their faces and the big heavy rosary beads. So you got the picture. They used to tell us stories. And I'm telling you, these stories resonated with me and they connected with me. And I'm reading the things in your books. These nuns were reading those different books. They're, <laughs> they were reading those books, brother. I don't know if that was forbidden in the church. They weren't allowed. But those stories they used to tell me are some of the very things that are in your books. And and you know what? They resonated with me as a first and second and third grader. And then all these years I had to try to deal with this. And now I'm putting these pieces of the puzzle together as I'm reading your books. And you've blessed me in such a way, brother. So just thank you. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you, brother. And it's all thanks goes to, to the Father and the Son. And, and I think that, you know, kids especially this day and age, they are so hungry for the truth. They want to know the secrets that are contained within the Word. It's just that nobody out there is teaching them about the, the you know, what is real as far as the relevance within the Word. Nobody is helping them to understand. And so when they read the Gospel, it reads like a foreign language, and it doesn't make any sense to them. And so it's it's meaningless, it's pointless. 
But when you can help them to have the discernment that unlocks all of the secrets of the word, they are so ready to come to relationship with the Father and the Son. And that, to me, is the greatest blessing because the children want the truth. They just have no idea where to go to get it. Oh, amen. And the situation is really grim in the sense that <clears throat> you've got um, the video games that have uh, that tell stories. They have storylines that are about fallen angels, about pre-existence, about incarnation. Uh, you've got the New Age groups out there, the Ashtar Command folks. What what what's happening? And this is this is not something that the average theologian. I don't mean to pick on the average theologian. I mean, God bless anybody who's going to dedicate their life to serving God. Praise Jesus for every single one of them. But it is a paradox, and it's a difficult situation when you're trying to help these people. What the what the New Age slash Galactic Federation of Light is doing is they are creating. A, a a alternate reality with their with their storyline that is so close to the truth that that it, it's barely that that it it rings true in the spirit of the people who hear the story. So they hear about well, you know, they they're told it's reincarnation, not incarnation. So all these people, their spirits are going, yeah, I feel like I existed before. Well, they did. So so you know, but it was incarnation. You know, they're, they're, it's so close to the truth. I feel like uh, I might have you know had a prior life, and I kind of feel like in my heart, my spirit kind of relates to this concept of, of 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 being part of a family in the in 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 the in the in the cosmos in the galact well you did you did at one time you did there were angel wars millions of years ago and and you were involved in them and 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 things didn't go right and now you're here on earth as a human the problem is that the new age has built this storyline that matches these m- Bible mysteries, the Psalms 82 paradigm, if you want to call it that, that is so close to reality that they're tricked into buying off on this whole New Age Galactic Ashtar Command deal as being true, when in reality they're they're giving just enough of the truth to trick them into joining it and taking Jesus out of the equation, which ultimately condemns them straight on a trip to hell. And it's and it's a it's an awful situation. And one more thing, Zen, because I want to get on to this next this this thing about the pre-existence of the saints in the book. That's real important. But I want to share this quick testimony with folks. I have the privilege of talking to some really, really impressive people. And about a year and a half ago or so, I had somebody who was very gifted and was uh, taken to heaven. Uh, multiple times and um, he had a brother that was also taken to heaven as well okay and his story checked out and he would call me on the phone and he was uh, I don't know the guy was in his 50s or 60s he's an older guy real nice guy God bless him and we used to talk on the phone a lot and um, he did not he didn't know anything about Psalms 82. He didn't know anything about Brother Zen Garcia's work. He didn't know anything about my articles that I wrote on the Angel Wars and the Original Sin. He didn't know any of that stuff. He was just sharing with me some of his testimonies. And one evening while I was sitting in the living room of my, my house talking to this guy on the phone, out of the clear blue sky he says to me, Oh, John, and get this, get this. The Lord told me that my brother Frankie is millions of years old. And I was like, what? I couldn't believe he said that. The Lord told him that his brother was actually millions of years old. I mean, I felt the the Holy Spirit hair standing up on the back of my neck. I was like, praise God. It was an unbelievable confirmation of the stuff that we're talking about right now. Praise Jesus. So, Zen, tell us about this whole... You know, uh, you know. Uh, uh, hold on, just a second. The um, uh, praise God, the pre-existence of the saints concept. Well, 
I use again, and like I said, uh, I speak about from the Old and the New Testament. I always try to bring forth the confirmation from there and then the back it with the other scriptures and passages which I've found in the extra biblical books which also expound upon uh, this premise. Uh, I start that particular that particular chapter in this part of the book with the story of Jeremiah because um, a lot of people understand that story and are very well familiar with it but do not understand exactly um, how it connects to predestination, pre-existence, and pre-election. And so for for the listening audience, it, it's what I had um, commented on earlier as the word of God, Christ, uh, Yahushua, uh, he tells Jeremiah that he knew him before he had ever entered into the womb of his mother and that he had foreordained him to be a prophet unto the nations. And there are other passages which also speak of similar stories. Specifically, um, there's a text called The Wisdom of uh, Ben Shirach, and, and it's speaking about another Old Testament patriarch. And he is in that passage, there's a similar reference. And then there's also another text called The Assumption of Moses, which has it built into it and expounds upon this kind of premise as well with the story of Moses and Joshua. And so I, I set the premise for the preexistence of the saints, and I explain uh, the whole story of Elijah and John the Baptist and, and all of that as well. And in, in doing so, I also speak out and speak about and expound on reincarnation and incarnation and what the difference is and um, so that people can understand from the scripture uh, how all this connects with because a lot of people have remembrance as you said earlier about you know about prior existence of having been part of creation and having had been in a spiritual form prior to coming into the flesh. And because they're only introduced to the concepts of reincarnation, they automatically assume that those memories and that that uh, revelation is tied to, like I did, because I I speak about how, you know, I came to this discernment in um, my own personal story, which is contained in, I think, chapter 14 or 15 in, in the book. But, Anyways, um, I thought the same thing um, because I didn't know any better at that time. And again, for those that don't know my personal story, I was involved in New Age concepts and New Age teachings for um, almost 20 years. And so a lot of the things that I learned uh, before coming to uh, the study of Scripture and, and to understanding who the the sun was, um, I was brought full circle back to the knowledge that was contained within the scripture. And so uh, having studied all of that and then having uh, read the scriptures with fresh eyes and looking into them with basically the, you know, the innocence of a babe, um, a lot of things were presenting themselves to me that others were not speaking upon and that nobody was actually explaining uh, especially in the mainstream churches. And so that's why it was that I decided to write the books that I wrote. But in um, in explaining the, the pre-existence of the saints, I basically te- take all of the, the scriptures on pre-existence, predestination, and pre- pre-election and align them to the stories of how Christ, well, first Christ pre-existed, of course, uh, and he was the reason why we are all as part of the creation now. But we preexisted with him. And there are many scriptures within the Old Testament and the New Testament that are connected to this knowledge, but that not a lot of people are explaining or elaborating upon them in any great detail because they have not made the connections that I make within the context of this book. And so through the chapters, 
I explain all of these different topics and explain how they align up with not only the saints, but also us as humanity, because Christ speaks about, you know, our preexistence within the word as well. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 um, is a, a good reference as far as that for those that want to look into what it is that I'm talking about. And I actually open the entirety of the book with that particular quotation. But uh, even Second uh, Thessalonians uh, speaks about how the the Father and the Son had knew us before the foundations of the world. And so once you have discernment on how all these things tie together and how they connect to the story of our fall from grace, uh, of our, you know, the war in heaven and even Adam and Eve's uh, banishment from paradise and Lucifer's banishment from the heavens, uh, how it is that it ties to our finding ourselves on this planet where we're learning through the knowledge of good and evil, through the dual nature of uh, pain and pleasure, uh, why there's a prevalence of evil in this this particular plane of existence, how this is that we're basically mortality and being in flesh form is a fallen state of being and that it has something to do with an original sin that is connected to our election and uh, to the responsibility of our own behaviors and not that uh, of association to Adam and Eve and what they did because uh, everybody blames them for our fall into flesh but that's only part of the story. And so uh, I elaborate on all of those things within this book to help you to understand our responsibility with with the story and also with coming to know thyself as Christ commanded us to do because it's in knowing thyself that we can bring ourselves to remembrance and understand our Creator and our part within the creation, and that we can embrace the responsibility of accepting our higher purpose and fulfilling our destiny, uh, that which was preordained for us before ever coming into the flesh. Hey, hey Zen, uh, I just, I've been scrolling through your draft here, and some of those poems that kind of tell your story in the end are incredible, like the one called Weather Report. Wow. <laughs> and the concrete, uh, the uh Concrete Jungle. Um, you you uh, you are really talented as a. I guess I want to call it a poet. Uh, wow, brother, you you've moved me. These these hey. poems have moved me, brother. Zen, you're a poet, and I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, another interesting aspect of this particular book is that uh, my first three books, for those that don't know, uh, that don't understand my story. Um, I, I wrote poetry books about my search, about my journey in seeking the divine. And so I utilized 15 of those poems from those particular books to highlight um, the concepts that I'm writing about in this in this particular book. And it's funny. And, and that's exactly that what they do. I have to jump in. That's exactly what they do. Amen, brother. That's what they did for me. Amen. I'm sorry I interrupted, but I had to say that. Jump back. Oh, in. Not, not, no, I appreciate you, Kenneth. And and so for those that, you know, have, have not ever been introduced to my poetry, um, I I do bring a flavor of that to this book so that I can tie together my personal story with my awakening and my coming to remembrance and to write it in prose and, and in a poetic fashion uh, to help people understand better my own personal story. So talk to us about that the circumstance and situation and the eternal security of inheritance. How does that all kind of unwind? It This sounds really fascinating. Well, you know, it all has to do, again, with what, why it was that Christ came into the flesh, why it was that he had to die on the cross, because he's the one that extended salvation. Uh, and also, it you know, in explaining his story and um, how he was God incarnate and why he had a special mission to fulfill, one that only he could 
you know, uh, could do, um, and and that how important that was for each of our lives in offering us an extension back to our first estate because without his sacrifice as you know allowing himself basically to be murdered and to be brutalized in such a way uh, we would never even have chance for salvation and so I tied together all of that and explained you know the importance of Christ in not only this book, but I always start my other books as well with trying to help people to understand who Christ is um, and how important he is to each one of our individual lives and why we should seek personal relationship with him because he is the way and the truth and the life. And, you know, without him, um, we could never even have a chance for a return to our first estate, for access in immortality once again. Yeah, you know, we had uh, uh, Brother Captain Black, Dale Black, on the show uh, a ways back. Uh, and he was he's the author of the book Flight to Heaven. He was actually died and, and was taken uh, to heaven. And his description in his book will bring tears to your eyes when you uh, listen to how he he was able to describe the indescribable and and his experience when he was when he was there the colors the sound the choice of words and the phrases that he uses to explain what you just can't explain with words was uh, was was anointed it was amazing it made me cry and um one of the things he said when he was on the show and this was absolutely profound as he said so, and I'm paraphrasing folks but he said basically when I was there, I had a sense that Jesus was so much more than any of us realize. Amen. And and I think where he was heading with that, folks, is he's talking about we think of him as the Son of God. We think of him as you know you know John ten ten thirty four I and the Father are one. God incarnate into the body of man and ultimately a or a, a form that we understand. Uh, in in a form that you know, in an image that we are similar, so we can relate to him. Um, but what what Captain Black was trying to explain was the the it was John one, uh, you know one through like eight, verse eight. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Or, I'm sorry, um, uh, Jesus was the. Uh, can can you can, do you have that handy? Wait, I have it right here. Uh, I'm going to read this because this is just absolutely powerful. Uh, uh, so if you go to the book of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. See, that is so... That's lofty language. That is very hard to make into something tangible that, with our tiny little brains, that we can get our arms around. And that's, in essence, the concept that uh, Dale Black was trying to explain. He's like, I was there, I was in his presence, and I realized, I sensed in his presence that he was so much more than what we are able to perceive with our eyes and our, our current senses. Right, absolutely. There are no words, no proper metaphors to explain the uh, immaculate nature of Christ. It's like even when um, Enoch was taken in, you know, up to the seven heavens and brought before the face of the Lord, uh, he says, how can I explain the ineffable nature uh, of, you know, what he was bearing witness to? There was no words. And so... You know, I understand where I think you said Captain Black uh, was coming from because I tried to, within my work, I tried to capture the fullness of who Christ is and try to explain to people how he was God incarnate and that his coming into the flesh is, is just him in flesh form and in something that we could understand, but. 
He is the light that made visible the entirety of the creation. And that before he was called forth by the Father uh, as the light and given dominion of the creation, all the sons of God, which we were part of that group, everything sat in darkness and nothing was visible. Nobody could even understand existence. And when he came into being as the light of the entire universe, as the entire creation, all things became it, it became visible. And then we had a concept as to the the nature of existence and the extension of eternity. And and even that is almost you know unwordable. Yeah, it is, it is, it is. Amen. I, I remember, um, you know, trying to get my arms around the, the vastness of that concept. I mean, for those of us who have had our, you know, relatively minor supernatural experiences and touch, t- you know, personal touches by um, by by Jesus, you know, the, our, our own individual encounters, um, uh, you know, when you realize... W- how big this is that is incredibly humbling and powerful i mean you know who is man that thou art mindful of him we don't realize what an unbelievable privilege this is to even have an opportunity to um to 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 have this choice of allegiance um will you talk about that whole concept of this you know the pre-election and the choice of allegiance Sure, but before I do so, I want to uh, comment on something that uh, Gina Marie is, is saying within the chat room. She says that uh, that this information is is scary to her, and I I have to admit that um, this information expands upon who we are, and it makes just our simple nature of you know, just being born and coming into the flesh, and most people think that we're here only to procreate and that we're here to, you know, have children and to raise children and to uh, and to pass on a, a lineage of name and, and inheritance. But that's not really what our purpose is. Uh, we've been deceived into believing that the physical aspect of who we are is all that exists. But we are much more than that. We are something that is greater than just that aspect of ourselves. And we've been lied to by Satan and by Lucifer uh, to only embrace that aspect of ourselves. He wants to uh, wants us to only dwell within and to take pleasure in the animalistic, into the carnal aspects of life and being because as long as he can keep us dumbed down to who we are and keep us from realizing the the larger aspect of our spiritual nature and how that connects us and how that is our connecting link to the creator and to the son uh he can keep us into believing that we you know are basically evolved of apes or that the ancient aliens were the ones that seeded us and created us. And he can exclude the creator and, and the son from the, the marvelous nature of having created us and given to us the breath of life, which gives us a chance for an eternal inheritance that they have been excluded from. And so I know that this knowledge is just mind-blowing and it's, especially for those that are new to my work and that have not heard about the principles that I am expounding upon here, I know that there are not very many, if there are any, um, others that are really talking about these things, and especially not in the way that I lay them out within the context of my book. But I only do this so you can understand who you are and why you are special to the creator and how uh, how incredible your power, your empowerment, your authority uh, is in being here in the flesh and that the flesh is only a, a fallen state 
of being that is holding us as spiritual beings, that we are spirits in flesh form, but that, you know, we should not allow the flesh to define us. We should allow the spirit who we are to define the flesh. And if you can embrace this remembrance, if you can embrace your higher power, uh, your higher purpose for being here in the flesh, and embrace the the knowledge of remembrance and know thyself, you can you can take responsibility for the incredible opportunities that we have every day to manifest the things that we manifest. You can also become aware of your power and your responsibility in uh, helping to to attract the realities that we find ourselves living in because we are responsible with our intent, with our behaviors, the things that we do in our everyday life. We're responsible for the energy that we send out into the world and that energy is multiplied and reflects back upon us. And so once you become aware of you know, your own personal responsibility in that manifestation and in creating the realities that you find yourself in, you can either change it or you can enhance it. You can use that energy to prayerfully call forth miracle and to assume the power that the Father and the Son has given to each one of us to do the things that we have chance and opportunity to do in our everyday lives. Now, as as far as uh, the, what was the question you asked me, John? I'm sorry. Oh well, well, let Kenneth jump in. He's got something real quick. And then, just to amplify what you said, uh, there are two instances in the New Testament where two of the apostles say exactly what you just said, there, brother. Over in Romans chapter. 8 verse 17 I believe it is we're referred to as heirs with Christ and then Peter in his uh, second letter chapter 1 he talks about these exceedingly great and precious promises where we're called into the glory and virtue of Jesus Christ and then he goes on I think it's in verse 4 and and he says that we are partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust so I mean I remember the first time that hit me it just come down on me. I was in a Bible study, and I was leading the group, and I read that verse, verse 4 out of the first chapter of his second letter. It came down on me so hard, and people were looking at me. They're going, Ken, Ken, are you okay? Are you okay, Ken? And most people don't understand that. And I'm talking about Christians here, brother. So what you're, what you're revealing through these, these old, lost, dusty books is, is the very essence of, of of what we are, this great and exceedingly precious promise. It's just amen. awesome. I mean, it's so exciting, brother. Oh, amen. And there's another there's another scripture. Here's something for you for people to consider. Once you get your arms around some of these concepts, it opens the Bible up onto a completely new plateau of understanding. For example, if you go to uh this scripture, first Peter two Verses 9 through 10. Now listen to this. He says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his, that's Jesus' own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Now listen to this. When he says that you are a chosen generation, think about the meaning of the word generation. Okay, the concept, if he was speaking to a group of people, all right, back 2,000 years ago plus years ago to an ecclesia, a gathering of people when he wrote this, and he said, you are a chosen generation, what does a generation imply? The the implication of the choice of the word generation is, uh, you know, roughly 80 years worth of, of, now think about it, but this was stated 
back 2,000 years ago. So how is it that this term, a chosen generation, can be material? How can it be applicable okay, to that one group of people to whom he was speaking to? In reality, um, uh, it is it, he, think about it. He's referring to a chosen generation of, of us that existed before the foundations of the earth. And again, this is in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, okay, called out of the darkness and into the light. We That's not a reference to today. That's a reference to way back then. That's a reference to the period of predestination. That's what I would argue. Praise Jesus. Can, um, and Zen, the question I had for you was, unless you want to make a comment on what I just said, the election and the choice, the pre-election process and the choice of allegiance. Okay, uh, let me read. I want to comment on something that you said first. Uh, in Ephesians, for those that are still new to the concepts that we're talking about here, it, it says this, which is, confirming what John just wrote uh, read about in that particular passage. In Ephesians 1, and I'm only going to read just a couple of verses, it says, uh, verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then skipping to verse 11, in whom also we have attained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, as far as allegiance and election and how they tie into who we are and the circumstances and the situations that we find ourselves in now. Uh, As I said earlier and as we commented upon, we're basically from, we find ourselves of, of three groups now, but we're all in the same situation in that we are in fallen flesh form and that we have a chance to align ourselves, to choose the allegiance of serving one or two masters, that of either Christ as the Word and the Son of God or of Lucifer and the rebel angels and siding with idolatry and with those that follow the broad way, the broad path of destruction, or to follow those that are seeking truth in the narrow way. Uh, The wheat and the tares, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, uh, the goat and the sheep, the the wise virgins from the foolish virgins, it, it's basically the two different groups: those that are the elect and of the righteous, and those that are, you know, the sinners and that are uh, counted among the wicked. That you have to perform and dedicate yourselves to serving one or two masters. And I spoke about earlier about how so many that find themselves in flesh form now. They couldn't make a determination as to whether to side with the elect and with Michael and the cherubim angels and fighting against Lucifer um, and and those of the rebel angels and, and those that joined him in insurrection, the one-third that fell with him. Many made no choice in that first estate, in being part of the first world age as to whether to side with either or. And so many are, that's the reason and that's the responsibility for being in the flesh now. The only thing is, is you can't be a fence sitter in the second world age. Because Christ said that if you are lukewarm, if you are comfortable in enjoying the pleasures of this life, and you do not make a choice to ally yourself with him and with the elect and with the righteous, that he is going to spew you out of his mouth. The Laodicean church and those that make no choice, that is your choice. That will be counted as your allegiance to Satan and your allegiance to evil. And you will be excluded, blotted out from the books of life. So you have to. 
in this lifetime, make a choice to serve the Father and the Son and to ally yourself with the Morning Star Administration because that is what will find you at being counted among the elect and being written into the book of life and give you a chance for salvation and return for the first estate. That's why you're here in the flesh, and that's the real reason. That's the only thing that makes uh, that that will make you know that is important. That should be priority for your life in being here is making that choice. And so I hope and pray that you do so, um, because really that's the that's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that counts. And as far as election, John was talking about why certain people were born into this circumstance or this situation, why you know certain people are poor, certain rich, and certain uh, with disabilities. Whatever the chance and whatever the circumstances, it all is tied and connected to election and pre-election. And that's why I, I utilize the whole premise of uh, Jacob I love but Esau I hated to explain election and, and explain how that is tied to our circumstances and situations and to the things to the you know to the how we find ourselves in life now because it's in understanding all of that that you can understand why things are the way that they are and why certain people are born, born into certain circumstances. It, election helps to explain all those things. And you will see, once you understand this premise and this concept and have discernment upon it, that the Father is absolutely just in the way that he has dealt with all of us. Oh, that's amazing! Very well put. Um, praise God. So the um, and folks to to kind of um, uh, reinforce uh, you know the what what Zen just said regarding you know uh, uh, making the decision to form allegiance with Jesus Christ as our King. You know the the problem that most of Christianity seems to have nowadays, the e.g. the Laodicean Church, if you will, is is that. Uh, they 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 acknowledge and know who Jesus is. They've been taught head knowledge wise who he is, uh, and 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 they, and they'll tell everybody that oh yeah I've made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. The problem is that they made Jesus Christ their Savior in the sense that they are hoping or believing or whatnot that he's going to go ahead and save them. But what they really didn't do is they never made him their Lord. See, that's where the whole thing breaks down. If Jesus Christ is truly your king and you truly love him, then you want to do what he wants you to do. If you understand this, see, there is a there is an assumption, this whole process of finding our way, you know, this whole process of, you know, um, cho making that choice of allegiance, having the spiritual acuity to sense that Jesus is real. That's one of the reasons why I have a vendetta, if you will, for, for, the, for the Galactic Federation of Lies and the New Age, is because they are using trickery to create a false reality that is so close to this reality that we're discussing right now that they're tricking people into forming a false allegiance uh, to their organization, which leaves Jesus out and demotes him to an ascended master. Now, the the point I'm making here is that that our allegiance, that part of this finding our way uh, here on the earth includes having the necessary spiritual acuity to sense all these things, but then identifying Jesus as our King and our Lord. And that Lord part is absolutely critical because millions of Christians will end up in hell because they did not get the Lord part. They only went after the Savior part. It says in John 3, 
16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him shall have eternal life, ultimately. Okay, now guess what? A few verses later, in John 3.36, it says... And you've got to use your Amplified Bible to get the, the true meaning of what it says. It says, And he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever disobeys the Son will never see or experience life, but instead the wrath of God abides on him. How many of the people sitting in the churches today are obedient to their Lord? See? And that's part of this process. And one more thing I'd like to share with you folks to help you understand how much we've been, uh, we've been well, we've been kind of cheated knowledge-wise. There's a reason why they burnt down the Alexandrian Library. There's a reason why people feared for their lives and hid the Textus Receptus from the Roman soldiers, okay? There's a reason why people buried the Nagamati Codices uh, in, in Nagamati, Egypt, okay? There's a reason they were afraid for their lives because they knew that the information that they had was revolutionary to the Christi to Christianity uh, across the world, and that these these demon possessed people would do anything to kill them to prevent that information from being revealed to mankind. Okay, now listen to this. If what I just said is true, which I believe it is, then it would stand to reason that the further you go back in time the closer you get back to the apostles, the closer you're going to get to the truth. The more time that evolves, the more time Lucifer and his minions have to, to burn down libraries, bury things, you know, kill people, do whatever they have to do, rape, pillage, and steal, lock up Vatican libraries, you name it, to keep the truth from leaking out to the elect. So if you go back in time and you study the Paulines, the Albigensians, the, the, Wald, the Waldensians, the, the Cathars, when you go back and study those ancient uh, groups of Christians who have been labeled intentionally as evil Gnostics, they're Gnostics, Gnostic is a bad word. Gnostic means that they have wisdom. But the, the, but the forces of evil twist the term of Gnosticism and make it into this, this, this notion that, oh, they must worship the devil. Really? No. Were there some Gnostics like Simon, Simon Magnus in the New, in, in the, who's spoken of in the New Testament who tried to buy the baptism of the Holy Spirit from, I believe it was Peter, that were, that were magicians and practices of dark magic? Yes. But that's a label that was used to falsely label some of the early Christians. The Cathars were referred to by the people in southern France as the good Christians. During the Roman Catholic Inquisition, the Cathars, when they were writing, when history was made and, and the Inquisitors were, were writing down uh, the information about the Cathars, the people in the local towns of southern France called them the good Christians. Why would they call them that? They call them that because as opposed to the other so-called self-proclaimed lip service Christians, these were the really good ones who practiced love and righteousness and took care of people and helped them and took people into their homes to save their lives. These were the good Christians. That's what they were known as. Let me read this to you. This is a reading right out of Wikipedia, believe it or not. Wikipedia on the general beliefs of the Cathars. There's a subsection in there called the human condition. What did they know, these good Christians in southern France, what did they know that we don't know today? Let's look at what this says. The human condition. The Cathars believed there existed within mankind a spark of divine light. This light, or spirit, had fallen into captivity within a realm of corruption identified with the physical body and the world. 
See, that statement that I just read to you in the description of the Cathars, who, by the way, were absolutely slaughtered by the forces of evil. Men, women, and children in the streets were sliced and killed and slaughtered to death in a unbelievable, horrible situation. By who? Lucifer's minions, the Roman Catholic Inquisitors. To why? To destroy the Holy Spirit. Because get this. This is right from Wikipedia. The Cathar clergy, though the idea of the priesthood was explicit re explicitly rejected, the consolamentum was known as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was a ritual that consisted of the laying on of hands and the transfer of the Spirit in a manner to believe to have been passed down in unbroken succession from Jesus Christ himself. And that's why the Roman Catholic Inquisitors and the soldiers slaughtered the good Christians of southern France in the 1200s. Get it, folks? They knew what we're talking about tonight on this radio show, and they were killed because of it. Praise Jesus. Zen? Well, you know, John, that we we are the prize in this day and age and that they are establishing the new world order and martial law and, and all that to, to come after us and those of us that know these things. Uh, they don't want us to... They don't want people to know these things because uh, when you come to know who you are uh, and you have remembrance on all of these things, then you you empower yourself in such a way that all the things that they think that they can do to us, they can't because we're out of their hands. We are not of this world. Uh, just as Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. When you have remembrance, you know who you are, you know what your mission is, why you're here in the flesh, what you're here to accomplish, and your priority is not on this world, not on the carnal aspects of life and the flesh. It, your focus is on the kingdom and a return to your first estate. And we are all, those of us that have come to remembrance, we're just, vacationing here we just have a short while yet uh, and we're going home but this is not our home and uh, being here with the fallen angels and 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 watching the things unfold as they are unfolding we're blessed to have discernment and we are called to be the ezekiel 33 watchmen to be good foot washers unto our neighbors and to help you know, all the brothers and sisters that we can to come to knowledge and all these esoteric things. But we know where we're really from and where we're really going, and that makes all the difference. There was one question, because I, I, I think we're running out of time, but um, somebody had asked in the chat room, how do you come to remembrance? And basically, it's in giving yourself completely to the Father and the Son, seeking the kingdom, just as it says in Matthew chapter 6. Make the Father and the Son in relationship with them, knowledge of the truth, your focus and your priority, and they will more than willingly meet you halfway. Oh, yeah. Amen. Praise God. It, you know what, folks? And, and in closing, and this has been an awesome show, Zen. God bless you, brother. In closing, you know, the, the thing here is it's not... Okay, so in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, we hear about our, our heavenly reward system. Okay, we've talked many times on this radio show, is that, you know, as it says in James, be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves. If we're going to be obedient to Jesus, uh, which is a requirement, John three thirty six. okay, then we have an obligation to do more than just sit in the pews, okay, because he's our Lord, and we should love him and want to do what he wants us to do now now but here's the thing the the gold 
silver and precious stones, which are metaphors for our works here on the earth, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, they, they, we're not, it's not talking about, it. We're, we're all different. We're all members of the body. We're, we're, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about the importance of every single member of the body. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15, when it talks about our heavenly rewards, uh, you know, gold, silver, and precious stones, okay, it's talk, it says we will be, they will be tested by fire of what sort they are. Not what quantity it is, not how much you do, but of what sort it is. Blood, I mean, uh, gold, silver, and precious stones includes doing good things for people. It includes singing in the choir. It includes holding the door for people at your church. It includes um, it includes uh, uh, going over to a, a little old lady's house or your grandmother's house and helping her clean the house and talking about Jesus to her. There are so many wonderful ways that you can be a kind and humble and giving representative of the kingdom and witness to people. It's not about quantity it's about quality. It's about coming from the heart. It's about coming from love. It's about being an appropriate, holy, and righteous representative of the kingdom which you aspire to be a part of. A holy priesthood of a new age raised up for the age to come. We are a very, very, very special group of people and it is an incredible blessing to have this opportunity not just to have the opportunity to have these levels of understanding that's an amazing blessing alone but to have this opportunity at an eternity that isn't just sitting in a beautiful house somewhere in a place called heaven for all of eternity but what does it all mean? What does ruling and reigning mean? What does the, the new millennium mean? What does ruling and reigning for a thousand years? What is a thousand years when you compare it to all of eternity? And what is it that the Father and the Son, our King, Yahushua, Jesus Christ, has in store for all of us for the eternity that exists even after the millennial role. Praise Jesus. This is the most exciting time to be alive in, and if I may quote the KFOR uh, meteorologist term, in the history of the world. Praise Jesus. Zen, do you want to say something in closing? I just pray that all of you earnestly seek out the Father and the Son, and please don't believe anything that we say. But do and seek out the truth of these esoteric concepts within the Word, and then take it before the Father and the Son, and ask them to show you in Revelation what discernment really is. Oh, amen. Thank you, Brother Zen, for joining us tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift you up and magnify your name, Lord God. We glorify you. We thank you, Father, for just revealing these wonderful mysteries to us. Father, we humbly uh, just lay ourselves before you as a human sacrifice. We lay ourselves before you and ask you to just empty our cups, Father, and fill us with only you so that we may be able to serve you in any way that we possibly can. Father, keep our hearts humble. Make us all good Bereans. Help us to test everything. Help us to, to, to do the homework that we're required to do, to, to, to show ourselves approved, Father God. God, to be good Bereans, Father, not to just believe everything that we hear, but to, but to, but to test us, to, to seek you, Father, so that you can help us to understand what our roles are, how we can better be more obedient to you, Lord God, so that we can partake in the final harvest. Lord, your, your scripture says in Acts 2, verse 20, it says, a blood, fire, and vapor, and smoke, and all those who call out upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Father. Father, enable us and embolden us us to do, to be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, and help us to find the place that we need to be, to be the obedient sons of God that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory, Lord God. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you all. Have a great night. Until Sunday with Jonathan Cleck. God bless you. <laughs>